in a world where signaling takes full commitment. One man did not want to commit. If my goal was to convince you that I could make memorable presentations, at least by economics profession standards, I could have stopped right there and became a regular talking head in front of the slides for the next 20 minutes, and I could safely assume that you were convinced. Or could I? Hi, my name is Igor, and I will tell you about credible dynamic signaling. I am sure that all of you are familiar with signaling models. The whole point of signaling is that actions can sometimes reveal agents' private information. For example, in the original Spence model, students can signal that they are of high ability by undertaking costly education, because high ability decreases the cost of obtaining that education. In a separating equilibrium, able students obtain college degree, while the less able do not. However, in such an equilibrium, a single day in college already is a conclusive evidence that a student is of high ability. It would then be optimal for the student to drop out of college immediately, after a single day, and enter the job market, where the firms do believe that the student is of high ability, and therefore agree to pay the student high wages. Obviously, such a situation cannot arise in equilibrium. A single day in college is not an effective screen that could enforce the separating equilibrium. So the question is, can informative signaling occur in such dynamic settings, in which agents need to maintain their choice of action and cannot commit to future actions? This is the question that I explore in this paper. Of course, this is by far not the first paper to look at the issue of dynamic signaling. However, the existing literature demonstrates a bit of a gap. This is in the sense that there is literature that claims that informative dynamic signaling is not possible in the settings that I described without either commitment or unreasonable off-equilibrium path beliefs. But on the other hand, there is also a significant body of applied literature that shows that in many particular settings there do exist informative equilibria in which information is meaningfully revealed without the need for either of the above. My paper bridges this gap, and it shows that informative dynamic signaling is in fact possible without commitment or unreasonable off-path beliefs. However, it can only take a very particular shape, which is attrition. In such attrition equilibria, the lowest type mixes between separating and identifying themselves and pooling with the remaining types, while their, all the remaining types always continuously pool with one another. And this is the only way in which information can be revealed in these dynamic signaling games. Now that I've showed you the results, let me show you the model in which these results arise. This is a dynamic model in what I call almost continuous time. So the time is discrete, but the interval length is vanishing to zero. So, all results I present to you today should be read with a qualifier if dt is sufficiently small. Now, the game is played by two players, the sender, whom I will call the agent, and the receiver. The sender has some private information, which is encoded by his type theta, which belongs to some finite, ordered set big theta. The receiver will, at every period, form a belief about this type of the agent. In every period, the agent and the receiver will play some Stackelberg game. So the sender will first choose some action A, which is then observed by the receiver and feeds into the receiver's belief PT. Once the receiver has updated her belief, she chooses some response B. After both players have chosen their actions, payoffs are realized that depend on both players' actions and the agent's type, theta. If this Stackelberg structure seems restrictive, I would like to assure you that simultaneous move games are not fundamentally any different. And although their analysis might be a little bit more involved and a little bit more messy, the fundamental results will be still the same. 
Another simplifying assumption that I would like to impose is that the receiver is myopic, meaning that in every period the receiver only maximizes her flow payoff. This is because without this assumption we enter the realm of repeated games, where the Falk theorem applies and so anything can happen. My focus is primarily on signaling models and investigating what signaling outcomes are feasible for the agent. So I would like to abstract myself and separate myself from these repeated games and focus on the signaling channel. The assumption that the receiver is myopic is equivalent to a few assumptions that are possibly more economically convincing. For example, it is equivalent to assuming that instead of a single receiver, we have a population of competitive receivers who compete for the agent's attention. Alternatively, instead of a single long-lived receiver, we can think of a population of short-lived receivers, each of whom observes the whole past history. In principle, the results of the paper would also apply to selected settings with long-lived receivers. However, the assumptions that we then need to impose on players' payoffs would be quite a bit stronger and possibly less appealing. Given this assumption that the receiver is myopic, we can then easily derive the optimal receiver strategy, which would just be a mechanical best response to the agent's action and the belief that the receiver has about the agent's type. Moving on to the sender, a pure strategy for the sender is a mapping from histories to actions. A given strategy is optimal for the sender of given type if it maximizes the agent's expected discounted payoff for some fixed discount rate R. We will mostly work with behavioral strategies, which map histories into a distribution over actions for any given type. An equilibrium of the game will then be composed from the strategy profile for the agent, strategy of the receiver, and the belief system of the receiver. We will deal with the concept of perfect base in equilibria, which in a sense is a minimal concept that imposes meaningful sequential rationality for games with incomplete information. In our setting, it requires that both players' strategies are optimal, in the sense that they maximize the respected payoffs, and that the receiver's beliefs are consistent with the agent's strategies on equilibrium path. To obtain the results, we need to impose two assumptions on the primitives of the model. And in the minimal setting with only two types, these two assumptions will also be sufficient to generate our results. The first assumption is monotonicity. And it says that the agent's payoff should be increasing in the reputation that agent has with the receiver. Here we invoke the order on the set of types that we imposed at the very beginning. So the order on the beliefs is a first or stochastic dominance order. And the utility from a given reputation captures the receiver's response to a given action as a function of the belief that the receiver has at a given moment. The second assumption we impose is called never dissuaded once convinced and it is an assumption on out-of-equilibrium path beliefs of the receiver. This assumption requires that the support of the receiver's belief is not increasing over time. This means that once the receiver has ruled out some type of the agent as impossible, the receiver never revisits this belief and never again assigns positive weight to this type. Without this assumption, the receiver could basically threaten the agent with unreasonable beliefs and uh, thereby force the desirable action from the agent. For example, going back to the job market signaling example, the firm could say to the agent, yes, now that you're in college, I know that you are able, with probability one. I am sure of that. However, if you drop out now, I will unlearn this fact. I will forget everything that I believed and I will believe that you are unable just to punish you. However, what the firm actually wants to do in this setting is the exact opposite. The firm would like to say to the agent, hey, I know that you are the high type now. You can safely drop out, come work for me right now instead of in th four years. It is in the firm's best interest to offer this renegotiation to the student. It is not in the firm's interest to maintain this threat of off-path beliefs. This assumption, NDOC, captures this logic. It can be seen as this kind of a weak form of renegotiation proofness in some settings. It can be seen as a refinement that requires reasonable off-path beliefs in some other settings. This assumption was originally introduced by Osborne and Rubinstein in the context of bargaining games, and it has been used, at least in some variations, 
in a white plethora of papers ever since then. So it is not an assumption that is ad hoc for this particular model. This is an assumption that is used in the literature. In this paper, I strengthen this assumption without loss of generality by adding pessimism of the equilibrium path, which says that after any off-equilibrium path action is taken by the agent, the receiver's belief assigns probability 1 to the currently lowest type of the agent. In a sense, this prescribes the harshest punishment for the agent of the equilibrium path. So any equilibria that existed under NDOC will also exist under NDOC with pessimism. These two assumptions are again sufficient for the result in the simplest version of the model with only two types of the agent. So let me now state this version of the result. In a model with only two types, if monotonicity of preferences holds and NDOC holds for off-path beliefs, then at any history the following holds. Any action that is taken by the high type with positive probability is also taken by the low type with positive probability. And this goes back to the impossibility argument presented in previous papers. It is not possible for the high type to separate away from the low type. However, it is the second part that is the new contribution. It says that the converse is not true, that there may in principle exist actions that are played only by the low type, but not by the high type. The second part of the theorem says that if action is played by the low type but not by the high type, then it must be myopically optimal for the low type. Again, the bottom line of this result is that the high type can never separate from the low type, but the low type can in principle separate from the high type. I call this the attrition equilibrium. And theorem 1 effectively provides a cookbook on how to construct these informative attrition equilibria. There you would have a high type playing some given pooling action in any given history, and the low type would mix between this pooling action and a myopically optimal separating action in every period where you would like to have signaling. So this was the result for the case when there are only two types of the agent. Now we would like to state a similar result for the setting with many types. However, this is easier said than done, and we first need to impose one additional assumption. This is a single crossing assumption, which is another assumption that is effectively native to signaling games. This assumption requires that, given the receiver's strategy, the difference of the agent's expected discounted payoffs from any two fixed strategies, as a function of the agent's type, satisfies single crossing. This assumption is tightly related to single crossing assumptions encountered in other signaling games, and in papers on monotone comparative statics. However, there are a few peculiarities that are worth mentioning. Firstly, this is an assumption on expected discounted lifetime utility, rather than on the primitive of the model, which is the flow utility function. Secondly, unfortunately, the single crossing assumption that you see on the slides is to some extent an assumption on an endogenous object. This is because the lifetime utility of the agent depends on the receiver's best responses in any given period. And these best responses in turn depend on the receiver's belief. And this belief, and how it is updated, is a part of equilibrium. However, as I show in the paper, there are many settings which allow for very simple tests of a single crossing assumption. And these examples typically involve utility that is either additively or multiplicatively separable. Now we can make our first step towards stating the result in the general model. Proposition 1 says that if monotonicity and single crossing hold, and the NDOC holds for off-path beliefs, then the analog of theorem 1 holds for strategies. However, the problem with this result is that it talks about strategies and not actions. Strategies prescribe actions at all future histories. We in turn would like to have a result about actions, about what happens in any given period. But there is another tiny barrier on the way. The issue is, cheap talk is effectively available in our game. With vanishing time periods with no commitment, any information that the agent could convey with cheap talk can be conveyed with actions, because any single action in any given period is effectively costless. 
Therefore, any information that can be conveyed with ChipTalk can be conveyed in our model. And we know from the existing ChipTalk literature that with multidimensional information, a lot of information can be revealed with ChipTalk. To illustrate with an example, the agent may be indifferent between holding two different kinds of average reputation. For example, one would say that the agent is average type with probability 1, and another would say that the agent is either high type or low type with probabilities 50-50. In this paper, I would like to focus on signaling rather than cheap talk. So the question that I ask is, can there be any information revealed in the signaling game that cannot be revealed with cheap talk alone? So can the fact that actions are not completely cheap lead to more information being revealed? So in other words, I'm talking about payoff relevance signaling as opposed to payoff irrelevant signaling, which is my equivalent of cheap talk. And keeping this distinction in mind, we can phrase the main result of the paper. It says that if monotonicity, single crossing and NDOC hold, then in any history in which payoff relevance signaling occurs, the following hold. Firstly, any action that is on path in a given period is played by the lowest type. So it is on path for the lowest type. This is equivalent to saying that there is no separating away from the currently lowest type. Secondly, some of the actions that are myopically optimal for the currently lowest type are on equilibrium path and they are only on equilibrium path for the currently lowest type. So these are the separating actions by play in which the lowest type can separate away from the remaining types. And finally, any action that is not myopically optimal for the currently lowest type is optimal for all types at this history. So even if different types can play different actions nominally, this is cheap talk communication, because all types are indifferent between all actions that are on path at a given history and are not myopically optimal for the currently lowest type. So the message of this theorem is effectively the same as before. The lowest type can separate from other types, but other types can never conclusively separate from the lowest type. But the informative attrition equilibria still exist, and the theorem once again provides a cookbook on how to construct these attrition equilibria. This theorem has a few corollaries that are worth mentioning. Firstly, if payoff relevant signaling happens at two consecutive histories, then the pooling action at the first of them is dictated by the low type's indifference. This is because the lowest type, of course, mixes between separating and pooling with the rest. This imposes even more restrictions on how an informative equilibrium should look like. The second corollary says that if no payoff irrelevant signaling is happening in equilibrium, meaning that no cheap talk communication is effectively taking place through actions, then at any history, the support of the belief is either the whole type space, meaning that the receiver perceives any agent's type as possible, or the support only includes the lowest type. And this is at a history at which the lowest type has already separated from the rest. To conclude, I construct a general model of dynamic signaling without commitment. This paper aims to bridge the gap between existing literature on dynamic signaling, some of which says that informative signaling in such setting is not possible, and some of which successfully presents example of informative equilibrium in such setting. So on the one hand, I confirm the old negative result, which says that no perfect separation is possible in this setting. But on the other hand, I aggregate disparate positive results, which say that informative signaling is possible in such a setting. Furthermore, I show that there is a wedge between signaling outcomes and cheap talk, and there is some information that can only be conveyed via signaling and cannot be conveyed via cheap talk. As a consequence of this positive result, I effectively provide a cookbook on how to construct informative equilibria in these dynamic settings. And this is connected to the final negative result that I obtain that I believe is relative to the general literature on dynamic signaling. And this result says that signaling can only happen through attrition in dynamic settings without commitment.
I hope that the version of me in chat has been doing a good job of answering any questions that could have came up during the talk. And if you have any further questions or ideas, I would of course be happy to discuss them. Thank you and goodbye.